This is Duke University. Thank you very much for um, coming today. And um, we are extremely honored to have a distinguished uh, speaker tonight on a very important topic. And uh, I will just briefly introduce uh, Ambassador Alberto Fernandez, who is um, now the Vice President of the Middle East Media Research Institute and board member of the Center for Cyber and Homeland Security at George Washington University. He retired in 2015 after 32 years, I'm sorry, <laughs> in the US Foreign Service with the rank of Minister Counselor. Ambassador Fernandez served as chief, mi chief of mission at the US embassies in Khartoum, Sudan, and Malabo in Equatorial Guinea, and was coordinator of the center, at the Center for Strategic Counterterrorism Communication, com Communications sorry, from 2012 to 2015. He served in uh, senior public diplomacy positions in Afghanistan, Jordan, Guatemala, Syria, Kuwait, and in the State Department's Near East Bureau in Washington, D.C. So as you can see, uh, you have been traveling quite a bit around the Middle East, and not only, but certainly you know the Middle East better than probably anybody else in this room. And um, I want to mention that after, well, before, but certainly after retirement, uh, um, Ambassador Fernandez has been a very active scholar. Uh, he has been publishing more than 25 articles in one year or two years, and uh, publishing books, and uh, he's uh, almost every week uh, on TV and uh, in different media formats. And uh, he's also, he has published a lot for uh, bookings, uh, Marcas Revista, the Harvard Review of Latin America, Middle East Quarterly, the Journal of the Syrian Academic Society, and has lectured and debated on US foreign policy in uh, various public venues, both in the US and uh, in other countries. Is, uh, he speaks fluent Spanish and Arabic, and English. And, uh, and uh, tonight he will uh, talk for 30 minutes, and then he will be um, um, answering questions. And the idea is to have more uh, a debate rather than just a, a typical lecture. And uh, before um, we start, I would like just to mention that uh, this week we are going to have a, another major event related to the area. Uh, it's uh, the Arab refugee crisis in the 21st century, and it's going to uh, start on January the 28th uh, at the uh, Holsti Anderson Room Rubenstein Library. We will circulate some of the um, invitations, and uh, it's a two-day conference, and there are a lot of very interesting uh, panelists, and the panels are covering from um, global hospitality, to crisis culture, to states of exception, to uh, poetry recital. So it's going to be a very lively um, conference, and uh, hopefully uh, those who are here could uh, join uh, some of the panels, if not all of them. And um, having said that, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to uh, to be with you all this evening. You know, it's it's um, it's been many years since I was a university student, but uh, I'm always happy to be uh, on campus. It's been a long time since I've been a university student, but I'm still a student of the region of the Arabic language and of that complex part of the world. And I want to thank the Duke Center for International Studies for inviting me. And I know that actually there are many in this audience that know a lot about the region, and I'm sure we'll have great comments and questions uh, about uh, what I'm going to discuss and actually anything else that you want to raise. So I look forward to that. You know, after more than three decades in the Foreign Service, most of them spent in the Middle East, I recently retired and began uh, working with the Middle East Media Research Institute um, as vice president, and memory has sought to bridge the language gap between the Middle East and the West. We follow closely the online and broadcast media space, especially in Arabic, but also in Farsi, Urdu, Turkish, and most recently in Russian. We try to present a range of voices, extremists, reformers, the serious, the ridiculous, the newsworthy, the obscure, 
and provide some analysis from our point of view in addition to a high volume of translated content. In my remarks, I'd like to look at the Islamic State, uh, look at our reaction to it, and kind of talk about some observations about where do we go in the future. You know, the rise of the Islamic State, of ISIS, of Daesh, has captivated the world's attention since the dramatic events of June 2014, you know, with the double, double reality of the fall of Mosul and the declaration of the Baghdadi Caliphate. The actual history of the organization, of course, is much more complex, as many of you know, with its immediate roots in Jordan in the 1990s, and then its rise and flourishing in American-occupied Iraq in the aughts and 2003 and on, its almost decapitation in 2010. Um, all of these things are often lost to the general public. But measured in comparison with most other terrorist groups and insurgent movements, the ISIS brand, the ISIS image, is a huge success. The fact that it's mobilized tens of thousands of people to flee their countries, thousands of those leaving comfortable circumstances in the West, is testimony to the power of its message. According to uh, one study, there are supposedly a thousand open investigations on alleged ISIS members in the United States. It most certainly does represent, as one scholar has noted, a revolutionary con contemporary appeal. While many of the components of the message are not new, the message itself, the way it's put together, is nothing if not contemporary. One of the things that drives me crazy when people talk about ISIS is this phrase about uh, they want to take us back to the Middle Ages or medieval Islam. We wish uh, medieval Islam was a much more tolerant, open, and interesting place than the vision that the Islamic State represents. Despite being new, its success is actually complete in the sense that the brand has such power now that it's actually not a specific video or statement that often mobilizes. It's the idea, it's the concept of the Islamic State. Uh, Abu Muhammad al-Adnani, the ISIS spokesman in September 2000, uh, 2014, gave the statement about attacking people in the West and killing people in the West. And yet when you see people radicalize or mobilize to take action, it's not because they remember something that Adnani said a year and a half ago. It's been internalized. The idea of doing something, of taking action, of, of doing a certain type of violence is something that has always been internalized by a very small number of people. The message embed, embed, in, embedded in this particular ISIS narrative of jihadist Salafism is revolutionary and extraordinary in its ambition and its promise. It strip minds selectively from the sweep of the period of formative Islam, and it can make one dizzy with the breadth of its ambition and the vision it seeks to offer. What's that vision? From socio-political marginalization to the socio-political center. From a position of insignificance to a position of importance. From exclusion to dictating the agenda. From confusion to a sense of mission from backwardness to the state of a superior culture, from isolation and misery to greatness and glory, from loss of identity to a distinct and even superior identity, from the provincial level to the global level, from the here and now to the historical and the eternal, from fear to courage, from weakness to great power, and from perpetual defeat to constant victory. Those are powerful thoughts. Those are powerful images. Confronted with such a compelling package, which includes this strong ideological component and a political project which is presented as seemingly successful and growing, and this 21st century appeal to substantive and consequential participation aimed at youth, youth that seem to be searching for purpose and identity in an apparently aimless, empty, and hedonistic world, it's the surprising thing is not that so many have been radicalized, but actually that so few have been radicalized. ISIS is a huge, unprecedented success, but it is only that 
if seen in these very relative terms. Despite the glitz and the glamour and the power and the videos and the head cutting, this is still a powerful propaganda image which has succeeded in, in, in mobilizing a tiny minority of potential pool of more than a billion Muslims. The challenge then of jihadist mobilization is a multifaceted one involving many things, especially what I think Thomas Heghammer called the cultural emotional dimension of radicalization. There's ideology, but there's more than ideology. Fouad Mohamed Agad, one of the Paris killers, said in a video in 2014, a message to the youth, he said, Jihad, Jihad, and I repeat again, it is the time of Jihad. The wind of faith is blowing, and it is time for the oppressed to rebel. He's talking about, this is not a message of people in the Middle East. This is actually a message in French he was sending to people in France. So it's not people that are being oppressed in Egypt or Iraq or Saudi Arabia, it's actually to French citizens that he was sending this message. So it is personal, it is rebellion, but it is also that ideological challenge. One of the problems I think that we as Americans often face is that we are uncomfortable with ideology. We see ourselves as post-ideological, we see ourselves as very common sense people, you know, Lenin said that ideas are much more fatal things than guns. Of course, he knew both about ideas and guns. Um, and, but we in the West have, with our kind of vision, our kind of skeptical and materialistic vision of the world, we have a problem understanding this. I think we should at least give our merciless adversary the respect of understanding something that was quite common in the West for many years for great good and for great evil. The power of sincere, deeply held belief. If we look at some of the communities that statistics tell us are at risk of radicalization by ISIS, the young converts, second generation immigrants, statistically those are communities that are high risk, people that are committed petty crimes, people that have been incarcerated for minor offenses. We see that the young convert, zealous, yet ignorant in his faith, second generation immigrant struggling with his identity in the West, does not usually look at this wide panoply of Islamic history. It's not like they sit around and look at Muhyiddin ibn Arabi, that great Sufi theologian of love, uh, and a 12th century Muslim born in Europe, or Ibn Rushd from Cordoba, that philosopher of rationalism, which has influenced both the East and the West for the inspiration. The young jihadist looks, if he looks at all, to a contending, noisy, and yet minority trend in Islam. One that has often existed, often raised its head, uh, but is a minority one to this day, but which seemingly in our day, in the media and in the discourse of politicians at least, eclipse the rich, complex tapestry of 14 centuries of Islamic civilization. For the Salafi jihadists in ISIS, there is a skewed reading of the period of the righteously guided caliph, the time of the Salaf and the Sahaba, you know, those 30, first 40 years. There's right now the time of the ISIS caliphate and the future and, less, and, and little, little more than that. You know, we see this when, when we see this kind of sterile debate about, is this Islam, is this not Islam, um, which, which misses the point. This is, this is Ibn Taymiyyah by way of Che Guevara, by way of Warcraft or Call of Duty. Violent, radical, shallow, representative of itself. So what fits this narrative in Islamic history or in the development of formative Islam for the ISIS propagandists is cherry-picked. And what is not useful is ignored. So for example, you can find violent extremists, violent Islamists of various sorts, including ISIS, recalling obsessively this historic event, the massacre of the Banu Qurayza, the Jewish tribe of Medina, at the time of the Prophet Muhammad. To give you an example, when um, uh, ISIS massacred the Shaitat, a Sunni Arab Muslim tribe of the Deir Zor area, the single worst massacre that the Islamic State has committed in Syria, 
they compared the shaitat to the Bani Qurayza. Shaitat who are Sunni Arab Muslims compared to a Jewish tribe that was massacred at the time of, of the Prophet Muhammad. For them, that was the comparison that they wanted to make. But these same radical voices, for example, would never notice or would never talk about the time when the Prophet Muhammad allowed the Christians of Najran, who were visiting him, to pray in the mosque of Medina. So they pick and choose these things which are useful to their discourse. Um, the ideological conviction is fervent, if sometimes shallow, and propelled by an intense, if narrow and sim simplistic understanding of a series of tropes or memes which they have weaponized. You see it in their discourse. Jihad, holy war. Kufr, unbelief. Shirk, polytheism. Rafid al Najis, the dirty Shia rejectionist. Tawhid, the tyrant. And of course, Tawhid, those are all negative words. Tawhid, right? Uh, strict monotheism. These are words that they use almost as labels, almost as killing words, to kind of, in a very superficial way, to give power and meaning to the actions they want to do. I want to recognize here a very important event which is actually happening today and yesterday, the Marrakesh 2016 conference which is happening um, on the protection of religious, religious minorities and which is a small but I think very positive and very uh, hopefully uh, uh, will have great effect in redressing the balance uh, in this space. The Islamic State is kind of, the way it's functioning today, is kind of like that extremist political candidate who maybe see, can seem to be doing well and can drag the discourse in a certain direction. So the seeming success of the Islamic State dragged others, rivals, critics, and imitators into a sort of ideological and propaganda arms race. You see this in the videos, you see this in the messages, how the Nusra Front or Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula or even the runt of the litter, Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb, have upped their game and changed the way they were doing things to survive, to adapt to the challenge of the Islamic State. Sp particularly true with Nusra Front and with AQAP. This deadly rivalry which is now existing could bear fruit even beyond the possible de defeat of ISIS in its Syria-Iraq heartland, given the shakiness of so many regimes in the region. I know that when I was in the government, um, as recently as 2013, I retired in 2015, when ISIS was beginning its rise as a separate entity, we hoped that the struggle between ISIS and Al-Qaeda would have them fighting over the same finite pie and a result discrediting both. Uh, in fact, I remember in CSCC doing a video where we used Al-Qaeda saying terrible things about ISIS and ISIS saying terrible things about Al-Qaeda. You are worse than Assad was one of the things that they were saying to each other. Uh, but we hoped that this kind of fighting over this finite pie would discredit both of them. But what happened is that their bitter struggle continues within the context of a growing pie. This ideological, ideolog ideological challenge is profound. Among the key statements that the Islamic State says about itself are the following. Here is the abode of Islam. Here is the land of the caliphate. The caliph built on the prophetic message, method. Here is the idea of al-wala wal-bara, loyalty to the Muslims and disavow of the unbelievers. Here is the market of jihad. Here are the winds of paradise. Here is the glory, and here is the dignity. It's not about blood and violence alone. And that's a huge mistake that we in the West make. Of course, ISIS is barbaric in much of its violence. Of course, it's brutal. Of course, it kills and brutalizes all sorts of people. But the attraction is not merely a negative one. There are positive elements in the way it's presented to the true believer, the person that buys what they're selling. Two weeks ago, a 15-year-old boy tried to stab a, to death a Jewish teacher in Marseille, France. And when he was arraigned, he said that he was ashamed that he'd failed. And when, when asked whether he represented ISIS, he had claimed the attempted murder in the name of the Islamic State. He noted, I don't represent them. They represent me. President Obama, I think, has acknowledged this in a way when he noted about 
the campaign against ISIS, and he said, this means defeating its ideology. Ideologies are not defeated merely with guns. They are defeated by better ideas. I think the president is right. I agree with that. He's made that point several times, but has not yet actually spoken about what is the ideology and what are the better ideas. And I think in the absence of doing that, it's allowed others on the political spectrum to, to fill that space for him and for the administration. If we look at the administration where it's gone over the past two years on the Islamic State, we see it going from minimizing the threat of the rising Islamic State as a junior varsity team, January 2014, the time of the fall of Fallujah, to say we will degrade and destroy it, September 2014, to that the Islamic State is contained in the Middle East, November 2015, to that that there are no existential threats to the United States and the ISIS does not form a threat to our existence, January 2016. I say this as someone who was in the administration until recently and who is on the record, unlike a lot of people, of criticizing both the Bush administration and the Obama administration. There's some truth in what the president has said, and there's also, as often with all politicians, some dissimulation and dishonesty in what he's saying. Certainly, the administration underestimated the threat of the Islamic State. They weren't the only ones, although the warning signs were there. The National Intelligence Council in 2005 said, looking ahead 15 years in their prognosis for 2020, radical Islam, I quote, radical Islam will have a significant global impact, rallying disparate ethnic and national groups, and perhaps even creating an authority that transcends national boundaries. That report, by the way, repaired, prepared under the aegis of the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, even featured a scenario where a caliphate was declared by 2020. If that's, if that's not enough, certainly the Islamic State itself, the precursor, the Islamic State of Iraq, announced in 2006 what was very much a proto-caliphate project, as Nebraz Kazemi and others have documented. It came this close to a caliphate project, you know, almost a decade ago. And certainly after its near decapitation in 2010, the organization made a remarkable comeback in plain sight, feeding off of the open sectarianism and incompetence of the US-supported Nouri al-Maliki government and the horrific bloodletting carried out by the Assad regime in Syria. When people ask me you know, to reduce ISIS to a bumper sticker, what is it? How did it come about? The way I describe it as a mathematical system is Iraq, plus Syria, plus social media. So there's room to blame a lot of people, a lot of politicians in government for what happened. Although its initial effort to penetrate the Syrian revolution failed in 2011, by summer of 2013, ISIS had taken the city of Raqqa from Nusra Front and from FSA elements. It was the first time in history that an Al-Qaeda organization had un contested sway over such a major urban area. I think in retrospect, the fall of Raqqa was a key, key element in the rise of ISIS. Now, not all that the administration said was wrong, far from it. The president, after his most recent State of the Union uh, address, was rightly mocked when he talked about the conflict in the Middle East going back millennia. He deserved to be mocked for that. But he was on much more solid ground when he clearly, clearly decried an alarming rise in rhetoric and acts of bigotry, hysteria, and Islamophobia, and an overselling of the ISIS threat. The threat of Tekfiri Salafi jihadism is a very real one, especially to the people in the region, including Muslims. But like any real threat, it can be and is manipulated or misused by the ignorant and the dishonest, by demagogues for short-term political gain. So what is the danger and the reality of what we face in the Islamic State? You know, I've spent most of my adult life working on or in the Middle East, mostly for the US government, and I have never seen such a consequential, dramatic, and destructive period as the one that we are living in over the past few years. In the Arab world alone, 
We've seen major upheavals in at least seven countries and turbulence and turmoil almost everywhere. The crisis of authority in the Sunni Arab Muslim world, the shaking of all institutions from the political to the spiritual continues unabated. And there is no reason to expect that this great unraveling will not continue and deepen with some major regional states at risk of new instability. I remember when I was in government, people in the government would tell me, US government is not uh, a credible voice to talk about radicals, radical Islam or ISIS or Al Qaeda. And then they would suggest regional governments. Uh, one of the problems there is that there's no evidence that regional governments have more credibility than others in talking about these issues as well. You know, this, I don't say this, uh, this, uh, these words about the instability and the collapse in the region with any pleasure. For anyone like myself who has deep friendships and relationships to people in the region, from Sudan to Syria to the Gulf, it's a terrible, terrible situation. It's a terrible tragedy that we're living in, in which affects real individuals, real communities, and places that we know well. This deep and continuing crisis in the Sunni Arab Muslim world has many origins, some of it going back decades, and many fathers, including the foreign policy of outside actors, including the United States, and the failure of political and economic governance in the region. The implosion of Syria and Iraq, key countries of the re region, and not these places on the margins, Waziristan, Somalia, Mali, South Yemen, with all respect to people from those places places on the peripheries, was an essential part of the crisis. If you set out to plan, to plan it, you could not design a better place or time for something like ISIS to grow. And yet, ISIS is part Ferrari and part Model T. It's a soaring, powerful vision that can move young people in unprecedented ways and a much more constrained, sordid, and messy reality on the ground. It's not so much a mass movement as a vanguard movement. But it does have this weakness that this visionary image exists, that exists is tethered to this, tethered to this battered proto-state facade that is slowly, all too slowly, caving in. One thing that I watched closely to watch the development was ISIS propaganda from the time that the coalition bombing in August 2014 began to this day, to see how much the ISIS discourse of victory and indomitable progress, would have to adapt to account for or explain the inevitable battlefield reverses. You'd think it would be logical for them to kind of hedge their bets and give reasons while things are declining. They actually haven't done this. There are calls, including the most recent one by Baghdadi, to persevere and stand fast. There are a handful of videos uh, talking about civilian casualties of the coalition bombing. There's a little bit of playing the victim, but not much. The boastfulness continues. The victory narrative continues. And actually, this is a tremendous weakness that it faces, and it's the ISIS brand. They've been able to maintain the narrative of victory by two elements. The actions and growth of ISIS franchises in places like Libya, Sinai, Nigeria, and other places, and these continued high-profile attacks in the West, which mesmerize our attention, Paris, San Bernardino. These mimic and, in a way, replace the preferred ISIS image of military victory on the ground. They would rather be marching into Baghdad or Damascus. But if they can't, they'll make do with spectacular events, spectacular actions that attract our attention. But as long as the idea of this growing and remaining state, the perception of momentum and forward progress will be contained, it's still going to have that power. You cannot contain the ISIS brand if the ISIS caliphate is merely contained. Unfortunately, the sheer number and size of the organization means that it's declined into mere al-Qaedism, into a terrorist group or low-grade insurgency targeting enemies in the region will take longer than it should. And as long as it has substantial members, <clears throat> excuse me, 
it can surge into areas where governance is weak, as we saw in the case of Libya and Yemen. And that is the greatest threat posed by the Islamic State. It may not be now or never an existential threat to the American homeland. It will be an ex existential threat to our own interests and relationships and with to vulnerable states in the Middle East and Africa. So yes, the Islamic State will carry out, aim to carry out spectacular attacks in the West. Yes, it will continue to try to piggyback on the news cycle to achieve maximum coverage by carrying attention-grabbing stunts involving mass slaughter. Yes, it will use this revolutionary message to seduce and inspire the rebellious, the idealistic, the bored, the fanaticized, but its principal danger lies as part of a spectrum of instability within increasingly fragile Sunni Arab Muslim states where there is deeply ingrained poor governance, poor economic prospects, injustice, relative deprivation, a young and alienated population in a polarized political environment where Islamism in all its many forms has become in many ways the default political alternative. ISIS is a nimble and learning entity so far and should be defeated quickly rather than slowly, given the environment where it flourishes. And there are many scenarios to do that, and I'm not a military expert, but you know, you can look at Ambassador Jim Jeffrey in Foreign Affairs recently talking about the judicious use of some ground troops, or Matt Levitt at the Washington Institute in political talking about rules of engagement. The situation in the region is extremely dangerous for America and our interests, but it's better to defeat this revolutionary challenge now focusing on Raqqa and Mosul than to be forced to do so later when you're talking about Cairo or Riyadh. ISIS is neither the coming of World War III nor a minor distant threat, but an important problem that needs to be treated seriously without exaggeration or hysteria, with common sense and with judicious use of American power. In a sense, both the administration and its critics have been manipulating the concept of the rise of the Islamic State to present a skewed image, either to play it up or to play it down. And they have done so not so much for international considerations, but often for domestic ones. For the administration, an administration of bin Laden is dead and General Motors is alive, the rise of ISIS was all too convenient. For the critics, especially many in the political opposition to the president, it became an irresistible tool to bash the administration with. And the bigger the threat, the bigger the club, and the louder the voice. Lost in this dialogue of the death has been a very clear-eyed uh, analysis on the, challenge, uh, on the challenge, understanding its very real success and limitations and our own national interests. You know, once the Islamic State is defeated, I believe, it is time to look at, some, look at the region in a different way. I think for some in the administration, this has meant the rethink has meant changing the subject or an excuse for ignoring the horrifying violence that is Syria or Yemen, or seemingly blaming a fictionalized past of eternal conflict for the apparent intractability of some of these problems. That's not what I mean. Uh, recently, an uh, administration official talked about that it is not the U.S. role to fix fundamentally broken societies in the Middle East. I think a case can be made in not overinvesting in the troubles of the region, in not being arrogant, in not imposing our ways on others, in not seeing everything as a military solution. But despite the horrors of Syria and Iraq, the crisis of regimes and the myriad of political and social problems that plague the region, I have to tell you that I reject this somewhat ethnocentric and arrogant view that these are fundamentally broken societies. Despite the conflict, despite ISIS and all of this, there is real hope and humanity and compassion in the Middle East if you look at the right places. I'm going to show you now a video that runs for six minutes uh, from memory, from our stuff, which kind of gives you a flavor for some of the discourse that is going on in the region, in Arabic, with people talking to each other, some of which, much of which, we don't see.
اي واحد عايز يطعن في الشريعه او يتزندق وعايز يستهبل ومفكرها لعبه يعني لا يظن ان سيسكت له وينبغي ان تكون رقابهم اهون عليهم من ازرار قمصانهم وينبغي ان يعني مرتد حكمه في الشريعه القتل بلا خلاف هل على المسلمين ان يقاتلوا اهل الكتاب حتى يجبروهم على دفع الجزيه؟ فنحن عندما نعلن الجهاد على المانيا مثلا على الدوله اذا رفضت ان تقبل ان يدخل الاسلام الى اهل المانيا. فنحن نخيرهم بين الاسلام او الجزيه والخضوع لاحكام الاسلام فمن وجدتموه يعمل عمل قوم لوط فاقتلوا الفاعل والمفعول به نص العلماء كيف يقتل الشاذ جنسيا نص العلماء أنه يرجم بالحجارة إلى أن يموت وقال بعض العلماء ويرمى من جبل هم يصورون الشريعة الإسلامية على أنها بعبع هم لو تعلموا الإسلام لأقبلوا عليه بشغف الإسلام ينقذهم من المآسي التي يعيشونها الشعب الأوروبي شعب تعيس يعني يخرج الواحد يوم من الصباح الباكر إلى عمله لا يرجع إلا سكرانا إلى البيت ليقعد أمام التلفزيون ويتناول عشاءه أمام برنامج ترفيهي ثم ينام ليصحو بالصباح الباكر ويذهب على نفس الدوامة حتى يدفع ضرائب لهذه الدولة التي تعيش على على هذا النوع من التنبلة التي يعيشها الأوروبيون الإسلام يحررهم الإسلام يعطيهم معنى للحياة هناك جانب كثيرا ما يردده الكثير من الكتاب بينما أنت ما اعرف هل انت لك وجهه نظر ام انك تتغافل عنه وهو الانهيار الاخلاقي في الغرب، لماذا لا تتحدث عنه؟ اي انهيار اخلاقي؟ نحن اصلا مفهومنا الاخلاق مفهوم خاطئ، مفهوم جزئي. نحن دائما عندما نتحدث عن الاخلاق لا نتحدث على الجانب الجنسي فقط. م. وهذا غلط، الاخلاق ليست هي الجنس. ولا هذه انا سبق اني اني ايضا اشرت اليها وهو انه عندما يدخل الانسان قصر فخم م. انيك فيه كل ما يبعث الانبهار والروعة ثم لا ينظر إلا إلى صندوق الزبالة داعش هي رأس جبل الجليد هنالك عمق لداعش داعش هي فئة من من الفئات الكثيرة داعش تعتمد على عقائد أو عقيدة معينة وعلى قراءة معينة للدين وتعتمد على فقه للأسف ما جرى ما جرى للأخوة اليزيديين في شمال العراق وغيرهم هذا موجود في الفقه في الفقه الشيعي والفقه وفي الفقه السني هنالك آلاف المنابر التي تهيئ الناس لأن يكونوا دواعش البوذيين كلهم يجب أن يقتلون هذا وفق الفقه الشيعي والسني ما أنا ما أقدر أقول أن بغلتي ببريجي هي مشكلة هي هاي هنا أنا بالفقه ولذلك أقول إما أن نتبع الفقه فتكون داعش على تقريبا على حق أو نتبع القانون المدني البشري المتطور اللي يقول اليزيدي مواطن كما هو المسلم الشيعي والسني ولذلك داعش يقول نحن لم نأتي بجديد نحن طبقنا الفقه اليزيدي إما أن يسلم أو يباع في السوق كجواري وهذا يتفق فيه الفقه الشيعي والسني فعلينا أن نقرر إما أن نتبع القانون المدني الوضعي الذي يكتبه المدنيون في البرلمان العراقي أو نتبع فتاوى الفقهاء يجب علينا أن لا نزوق الأمور ونقول الإسلام دين رحمة وسلام وما يورد وكل شيء زين يا أخي تاريخك الإسلامي كل حروب وغزوات حضرت حضرتك لا ترى الدين الاسلامي دين رحمه وسلام تونس مليون سيد اياد سيد اياد لا ترى ان الدين الاسلامي دين رحمه وسلام رحمه ولكن هنالك قراءه للاسلام عمرها 1400 سنه سيس الدين واصبح الدين عباره عن سيف يدعو قران يدعو وسيف يحمي هذا شعار اخوان المسلمين وشعار كل الاحزاب السياسيه الاسلاميه هذا الشخص الذي يقوم بعمل التفجير نعم. ويفجر نفسه هل هي حالة نفسية معينة؟ هل هو عاقل؟ آه يعني هو عاقل عاقل ما نقدر نتهمه نعم. بأنه يعني آه يعني مختل العقل نعم. كذلك أنا لست مع اللي يقولون أن هذا مضلل 
مضلل او مغرر مغرر بهم او مضلل لا يعني نعم وايضا لست مع انه يقول لك ان هذا جهله نعم يعني لا يعرفونه بالعكس هم يعني يستشهدون بالنصوص ويقارعون الحجه بالحجه و لكن احنا نقول فكر اصحاب فكر منحرف نعم اللي خلاهم منحرفين التشدد احنا ما نجحنا نعم في ان نحبب اولادنا الى الحياه نعم علمناهم كما قيل كيف يموتون في سبيل الله نعم ولكننا لم نعلمهم كيف يحيون في سبيل, في سبيل, الله. في سبيل الله كيف يعمرون في سبيل الله كيف ينتجون كيف يبدعون كيف يخترعون نعم. كيف يبرزون قيم الاسلام ويتسامحون في سبيل الله نعم. يعني وهذه المشكله نعم. هم فهموا الجهاد فهما مغلوطا نعم. فهموا الامر بالمعروف وتغيير المنكر فهما مغلوطا نعم. واضافه الى ذلك كرهناهم في الحياه نعم. حقيقه كرهناهم في الحياه عن طريق ان هذا حرام وهذا وتشدد الزائد تشدد الزائد نعم. تشدد الزائد يعني هو طريق من الطرق اللي تخلي الانسان يعني يعني يكره الحياه نعم والانسان اذا كره الحياه فما اسرع ما نعم. يريد يعني من بوابة البوابة الانتحار والتفجير للوصول إلى الجنة كما يظن ولقاء الحور كما فيريد أن يخرج من ضيق الدنيا إلى سعة الآخرة فإحنا واجبنا نحبب شبابنا في الحياة كيف نحببهم؟ عن طريق التسامح التعددية المذهبية ثراء الفكر الديني <laughs> so a couple points on the compilation. First of all, you could make such a video about any society, right? You could do that with our own. You could have all kinds of wackos and strange people saying things and put them together. I excluded ISIS voices on purpose because I thought it would be too easy of a contrast. The intolerant voices at the beginning represent obviously a powerful trend in the region's discourse, if not often the loudest one, but not the only one. Uh, you know, all too often we think that the discourse in the region is only extremists. So you see the extremists at the beginning, and then you see actually the, the critics, the liberals, the secularists, and others. This is something that we all too often miss. And the important thing is the discourse of the reformists, the discourse of the liberals, is happening by people that are doing it for their own reasons. They're not doing it for Uncle Sam. They're not doing it because they're being paid by us. They're doing it because they're things that they believe. You know, the biggest error that we can make on the region is to reduce it to whatever sim simplistic line ISIS or regimes or our own elites here seek to reduce it to. It was and is so much more despite the daily horrors that we see. After the defeat of the, this ISIS state building project, which is different than the defeat of ISIS completely, uh, rather than hightailing it to East Asia or, or falling into the default position of supporting the usual autocratic regimes, there's an opportunity that I would hope we as a country and as a government would, would seize. And that is to finally move to a position of support where we support with both realism and humility people and governments in the Middle East that prioritize those humane and tolerant values and traditions that we hold dear, but which are also universal and which are also embraced by so many in the region, where we try to be consistent in upholding these values rather than sacrificing them for short-term expediency. I remember when I was a young officer and I first went to the Middle East in 1983, and I was told uh, by my first interlocutors in Arabic about the struggle between your principles and your interests, you know, and that basically the U.S. always picked, of course, its interests over its principles and its values. I would hope that we've learned something. In the end, 
I don't agree with that senior administration official. These are not broken societies, but deeply wounded ones. They fully deserve our solidarity and respect. And despite the poison of the jihadists like ISIS, the duplicity and hypocrisy of many of the regimes, the burden of history, and our own, our own many historic missteps and blindness, there is still, still to this day, a real reservoir of goodwill towards the American people. I found it to be so for decades. And that is a sounder, longer lasting foundation to build on going forward in the Middle East. Thank you very much and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you very much, Alberto. And uh, we, we are recording, so for question, we have a mic that is going around, so please, we open the floor, any type of question, Transition. Thank you very much, appreciated that, uh, particularly the fascinating compilation of uh, videos. I wonder if you could extend a bit the glimpse you gave us there of comment around the Arab world to summarize and give us some sense of a f immediate future trajectory of policies in the surrounding nations. You, you focused mainly on the challenge for, for the US, but surrounding Arab nations, Turkey, Iran, could you give us yeah. something of a glimpse of how things are there and where it's likely to go. Well, I think that, that could be for another conference. Well, uh, but, but I'll say this. I, I think that's a really important point. The, you know, the, the crisis that you see in the Sunni Arab Muslim world is because of real things happening in the Sunni Arab Muslim world. But one of the elements that is happening is it happens within the context of the rise of other regional actors. Israel, obviously, a traditional, traditional adversary and a traditional actor. Turkey, Iran. So you have basically the seeming disarray, the seeming collapse of authority, of regimes, of the kind of a future vision for these countries at the same time that those three places are taking off. Uh, this is a, you know, kind of a, a deeper problem that the region faces. Uh, and of course, one of the challenges and one of the things that feeds into the I ISIS rhetoric is, of course, the deep, deep sectarian conflict that we see today. The, 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 the Shia-Sunni civil war, or civil war, cold war, which is not so cold, which is most seen as kind of this conflict between Saudi Arabia and Iran, but has ramifications through, through, through the region. This is a huge problem. And I know, you know, you study Islamic history, and of course, you know, you can go back and that was always there, but it was not like today. It's not like today, the same reason that ISIS is not like today. You know, there are all organizations, Al Khawarij Wal Karamita, you know, there are organizations that were extreme and radical and did stuff in Islamic history. The difference is we're in a globalized world. We have all satellite television, we have social media. So the, the effect of the good and the effect of the bad is actually you know, expanded. So I mean, I think the, the action of the neighbors is, is something which does affect this kind of problem that exists within the region, within the Sunni Arab Muslim polity. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for uh, a very interesting presentation. And I think you uh, made a very uh, convincing case for showing how ISIS is a, uh, what should we call it, a hyper-connected, hyper, is a product of a hyper-connected, hyper-mediatized, spectacularized kind of phenomenon, mm -hmm. which is the politics of today. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I'm also wondering about the sociological aspect, mm -hmm. that what are the institutions, and I'm thinking about it in the long term, that has sustained, what is the role of the ulama or what is the role of the mosque organizations that has sustained this kind of transmission? And oh, I'm sure it's been radicalized since the 19th century or whatever, but uh, I mean, and, and how do we get at it? I'm not just talking about, you know, mosques in Britain or something, but generally in the Middle East itself. Well, you know, one of the things that's happened, and it's, of course, a very polemical issue in the region, and, and not just in the region. I've seen it in sub-Saharan Africa, in, in Niger, and Mali, and in other places, is, of course, 
that there was an investment made over time in a particular type of Islam. There are many Islams. There are many types of Islam. There are many types of Muslims, just like you would expect a billion anything, right? You're going to have tremendous variety uh, in a billion people, no matter where you pick them. Uh, but certainly the political patronage, the money, the funding, the scholarships have promoted Salafism for decades. I was in Niger uh, a year ago and I met with the traditional ulama, the head of the heads of Sufi Tariqat and Zawiya and all kinds of people, different, uh, different views of things. And their number one complaint, their number one complaint was not about American imperialism, it was not about the French, it was not about Israel, it was about people coming back from the Gulf with bags of money, telling people that the Islam that they had practiced for a thousand years was wrong. You know, so you have the Salafization of discourse. And as you can see from the video, it's still a minority view, but it has power. It has means of propagation. And so you have ISIS is part of a wider phenomenon of Islamism. And there are many types of Islamism, of, you know, from, you know, political Islam to political parties to civic discourse and, and stuff like that. And there are extremists as well. But so the, you know, a lot of the oomph, the, the, the impetus in the region has gone to that particular part of the spectrum. So it skewed the, it skewed the region, even though it's still a minority view in the Muslim world writ large. But if I may just yes. pursue that, because yes. I think we're getting to something important here, yes. which is that why not... Why don't we focus on this particular brand of Salafism, mm -hmm. find its sources of, I'm sure it's known, its sources of funding and expansion, and, and, and work along that instead of, you know... These well, I, I'd say two things. I, that's a good question. I mean, number one, I would say, kind of like ISIS, it's, it's a machine which now doesn't need to run on new fuel. You know, any ideology, any world view, it reaches a point, a critical mass, where it kind of moves along by itself. And so that investment over time in Salafism, and including in Salafi al jihadiya jihadist Salafism, is something that's happened over time. And it's not like we can press a button. I know people in government work on terrorist financing and all of that stuff. It's... It's kind of bolting the barn door after the horse has already taken off. In a hyper-connected world. Exactly. So, but it's still, I think you're right, ideology matters. And of course, one of the challenges is how do the voices that we heard here of people who are talking about tolerance, about humanity, about a, uh, a, a humanistic vision of Islam, how are those people empowered because the United States can't actually do that. The moment we put our grubby hands on it, you know, it'll have Made in USA label on it. So we need to help, we, meaning humanity, to help them, but we're not actually well positioned to do that. This is a fight within Islam among Muslims um, that's very consequential to the rest of us because of this globalized situation that we live in. Uh, hi there. So, um, first of all, thank you very much. I'll wait for a little second. I just wanted to follow up on the previous question in a way, I guess. Yeah. Um, just starting off by saying that, um, that in a hyper-connected world where in America the first thing to go global on Facebook to go viral is something that's terrible and horrifying, like those videos, mm -hmm. like all the stuff that's happening, and then the next thing, that's something that's like easy feel good, like cute kittens and yeah. et cetera. It's the same phenomenon. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I guess as an ambassador, as someone who's kind of worked on relationships, on um, figuring out how to maintain relationships, how to make everything um, work smoothly, yeah. what would you say, in your personal opinion, is the best way for us to enfranchise those voices that we were talking about that you mentioned as part of like your solution as you're yeah. um, at the end of your speech and just our, what would you like to see happen that yeah. we could do that's reasonable? Yeah, well, you know, that's a very good question. For me, the two things that miss, you know, and I, 
I lived this when I was in the government. You know, um, the president talked about better ideas and about their ideology. The two things that I feel that the good guys, I'm not talking about the U.S. government or the U.S. government alone, I'm talking about the good guys in general. Um, the two things that they lack, which the Islamic State has in its, in its uh, propaganda game, are volume and passion. Volume, in, you know, uh, there's a friend of mine who wrote a piece that said it's ridiculous that ISIS is winning. ISIS is losing. Three billion people watch the Captain America movies. But of course, those three billion people didn't put a shield on their back and decide to, you know, become Captain America. You know, yes, if you talk about the world, certainly ISIS does not radicalize or influence the world. You're talking about a narrow niche of the population, a very slice small slice of the pie. In that space, they outnumber us. So you need volume. You need, you know, if you can't create it yourself, you need to buy it or rent it or do something to get it. Uh, I've written about various strategies on how you can do that. But you basically need, you know, if they have a troll army, if they have an online community of interest of people that amplify their message like ISIS fanboys, you know, uh, Fursan uh, al-Tahmil, the knights of the uploading, as they call them. You know, we need to find our own, meaning we, meaning those that are opposed to them. And then passion. You have to really care about these things. You have to be motivated about them. So I think there are some kind of common sense things that we really haven't tried yet that we need to try. It's not like this ideological, individual, uh, personalized battle has been fought by the counter-terrorist people and lost, it actually hasn't been really waged at all. And you know, because ISIS has the numbers, because they have the fans, because they have the, the zealots, that gives them an incredible luxury of spending time. You, some of you may have read this piece that Rukmini Kalimachi wrote in the New York Times June of last year, ISIS and the Lonely Young American how this young American woman was radicalized in Washington State, in the middle of nowhere, on a farm. There are no Muslims anywhere where she lives. She was radicalized online by ISIS people. They spent hundreds of hours getting her to where they wanted to be. You know, she was this close to getting on a plane to Raqqa with her 11-year-old brother as her mahram, you know, because she's a single woman to have a male of the family keeping an eye on her. She was this close to doing that. They spent hundreds of hours basically going after one person. This is the advantage that volume uh, gives you. Volume has value. You can have, and you all know this if you're on social media, you can have the most ridiculous idea in the world. You can have the stupidest, most racist thing in the world. If it's multiplied by 1,000 or by 10,000 or by 100,000, it has significance. So, I mean, that's what I think what you need to look at. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi. It, is there a precedence in U.S. history or world history where, as we're talking about, the focus is focusing on the ideology mm -hmm. versus fighting a nation state? Yes. Um, where there's been a successful um, event where the U.S. or any other world party has been a a power or a, a catalyst for facilitating change by focusing on ideology, not necessarily toppling a government, but um, you know, focusing on mind states and, and ideology? I don't think so. That's why I think you have to do both. You know, you have to, that's why the number one thing I said is it needs to be defeated militarily. If its, if it's vision is based on success, which it is, law, right? We're conquering the world by permission of God. We're going to cut your head off by permission of God. The, the easiest, the clearest way is military defeat, and that affects the ideology. The problem is it's nested in a much larger worldview, so you have to kind of, you have to seek military success, as distasteful as that may be for some of us, and you also need to work on kind of the worldview, the ideological factors that feed into this. The way I describe it, you know, there's a talk about propaganda. There's a very famous Nazi propaganda film, masterpiece of propaganda, Lenny Riefenstahl's um, um, The Triumph of the Will, 1934. Triumph of the Will is a huge propaganda hit. 
when it looks like Germany is, we're, we're number one, we're winning. Guess what? You show Triumph of the Will in the rubble of 1945 Berlin, it doesn't, it's not very effective. So ideology and, uh, and propaganda are tethered to the real world. So you need kind of real world effects. Uh, by the way, I'm not saying that Raqqa or Mosul should look like Berlin in 1945, but they need to be discredited. That is the clearest and simplest way to puncture the ideological and propaganda challenge. Uh, Ambassador Fernandez, you have, had, in your remarks, I think you have identified a long-term destabilizing factor in the Islamic world, which is the rise of the Salafi mm -hmm. brand of Islam. Mm -hmm. And that has been funded largely by Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. and who have been our allies, but they've been playing a double game. Yes. And ISIS is clearly part of the Salafi movement. It's, just, it's an mm -hmm. offshoot of that yeah. change in Islam. So I'm wondering if, do we have, is there any possibility of American leverage with the Saudis to get them to stop promoting radical Islam as opposed to diverse Islam? I think that's a great question. I, to be frank, and I'm being blunt here, I'm not in the government anymore. I don't think the U.S. has had, really had that sustained discussion over time with the Saudis. I'm sure it's been brought up at times about, you know, textbooks, you know, because uh, they used to have, there was a, the textbook issue or the preacher issue. It's been brought up on an ad hoc basis over time. But, you know, this is state Salafism in Saudi Arabia. And so Saudi Arabia is in this interesting situation that Saudi Arabia is both a number one target of the Islamic State, but also propagates a worldview which is extraordinarily conducive and helpful to the Islamic State. We produced in memory a report recently about uh, sectarian propaganda put out by the Saudis and by Salafis, basically calling Shia dogs and pigs and subhumans and the worst, ugliest thing, you know, something that looks like you'd see in Nazi Germany, you know, al Wisal television and this kind of uh, stuff. The, Iran does it too, but not as much as the Saudis do it. And so I think that, speaking as a former diplomat, there is, a, I think, an urgent need for a sincere, frank discussion, you know, behind the scenes with senior administration officials and the Saudis. But I, what I know from the past was what usually happens is we come in with our laundry list and they come in with their laundry list of things we want them to do and they have things that, you know, usually things they want to buy from us. And this discussion we usually don't have. So I agree with you. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I was wondering if you think that ISIS will take or already taking some role in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And I mean, does they have any interest or have any effect on the conflict? Well, they, they are always looking for the next thing. What is the thing that is going to attract attention to get them recruits? to keep them in the center of the story. By the way, they, if you go back to 2006 when the Islamic State became the Islamic State, they said, we're not interested in attacking Israel. Our first, our, whoops, our first adversary is not the Jews, of course for them Israel and the Jews are the same thing, uh, is not the Jews, it's not the Christians, it's not even America. What the Islamic State said, their first number one goal is a reckoning with a Rafidah and Najis, a reckoning with the Shia. They, that's what they say. The Shia are worse than the Jews. For them, you, nothing can be worse than a Jew, right? So to say the Shia are worse than Jews just shows you. So yes, I mean, they, they talk about Israel sometimes because they're always looking for what's in the news. So for example, in, in late 2015, ISIS had these video series. The first one was about refugees. Everyone was talking about refugees. So they did 15 videos on refugees, basically saying, don't come to the West. If you come to the West, you know, the Pope will convert you to Christianity. Uh, and they had a picture of the Pope, you know. Uh, you know. And then they had a series about when there were these stabbings in Israel, saying, 
you know, they wanted to incorporate that into their discourse. So, yes, they refer to Israel and they refer to conquering Jerusalem and, you know, conquering Rome and they're into conquering stuff. But they've always said their number one thing is a reckoning with the Shia. So. Thank you. Yeah, going back to the question, um, what is your take on the uh, on the ISIS discourse in America, particularly in in this presidential campaign? Mm -hmm. How well the, do the presidential hopefuls um, know the know ISIS and the case and the whole context? Thank well, you. Well, I, I I work for a five hundred one c three NGO, so I'm not going to endorse any candidates or uh, attack any specific candidates. I think that there's a lot of ignorance when people talk about ISIS. Uh, there is this concept, as I said, that, you know, it, it, people engage in these debates that actually have nothing to do with the issue in the region. They have to do. So you see this thing about, like, basically, who's more macho, you know? Who can talk tougher about the Islamic State? I'm going to kill them. No, I'm going to kill them twice, or I don't know what. So it's, uh, the way I see it, there's, it's, there's a lot of hot air, as often is in elections, about <laughs> about these issues. I don't think it's that consequential for the propaganda of the Islamic State. If you look at the propaganda as I do, you know, I've, I basically have seen, sometimes seen many times, every single ISIS video that has been produced over the past five years. You know, so I'll see something and say, oh, I saw that, that was in uh, Salil al-Sawadam number one, you know, or whatever. Um, and the, for example, the discourse of Islamophobia or of intolerance against Muslims is, is not an important factor in ISIS propaganda. It hasn't been. Obama is more frequent in ISIS videos. Bush was more frequent in ISIS videos. It's presidents, it's rulers, it's people who have power. Not, not Le Pen or Trump or... And Nigel Farage, you know, maybe if they ever came to power, it would change. So, but that discourse, of course, has an effect here. If we know, for example, we do know that one of the at-risk communities for the Islamic State are converts and second-generation immigrants, we need to at least be conscious of the fact that Things that alienate people that are already in subject, that are already in danger of being alienated, is not a good thing. So I would leave it at that. Thank you. Hello. Okay, you have been uh, in Middle East for a big part of your of your yeah. career. Um, during this career, uh, many presidents many administration had changed. Can you identify a trend or something that has changed in the people from the Middle East in their interaction with the Americans that are there or how they perceived the policies yeah. of the Americans? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a good question. Of course, it depends who you're talking to. You know, who in the Middle East you're talking to. I would say generally the discourse and maybe this is human nature, it might not be, have anything to do with the Middle East, is people always say how the old guys used to be better. You know? The old guys, so let's talk about Bush al-Ab, the first Bush. They like him, you know? Or Eisenhower, you know, back in the day, you know? In Sudan, when I served in Sudan, they loved Reagan. There's a street, they, they actually... Uh, Sudan was facing a famine during the Reagan administration, and they send a lot of sorghum. So they call it Dura Reagan, Reagan, Dur uh, Reagan sorghum. So there's, I think a, maybe it's a human tendency to always think that the old guys were understood you better, respected you more, were more civilized, were more tolerant. Now people are superficial, they don't give a damn, they're not polite, they're, they don't know anything, they make things worse. I don't know if that's actually true, you know? Uh, so there's a lot of nostalgia for the way America used to be, or America's relationship with the region used to be. That's, that's what I would say about that. Yeah. Thank you very much for a um, very stimulating talk. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit 
about your um, proposal that um, a way to go is to discredit um, ISIS, Islamic State, militarily. Yeah. Um, and yet a little earlier in your talk, you were saying there is Nusra and we have this Salafi engine yes. that has now got a momentum of its own. I think you even said that uh, it doesn't need new blood or, yes. or oil or whatever. Yeah. So what good would it be to have um, Islamic State discredited militarily? Yeah. No, I think that's a good point. I, I, the way I see it is, you know, uh, Nusra is the uh, potential big winner in a campaign against the Islamic State. And Nusra has been very smart in the way it's positioned its discourse. They are Salafi jihadists. Nusra is part of Al-Qaeda. Uh, not a big difference between them and the Islamic State. But the way they've sold themselves, presented themselves, has been clever. It's been smart the way they've handled themselves in, in their discourse, even though their actions are not that different. Um, look, the reason I would say focus on the Islamic State is because the package that the Islamic State has right now is one that is appealing to wide populations that Al-Qaeda does not have. You know, Al-Qaeda has people that join it. And in fact, you mentioned Nusra, and that's a really good point. You know the difference between Nusra and ISIS in the way they recruited people in Syria in 2013 and 2014? Nusra did it the way Al-Qaeda did it, which is, you want to join? Well, we need to, who are you? What's your background? Where do you come from? We need to check up on you. They're very selective. Nusra was extremely selective about who they would choose. ISIS... Welcome, come on in, everybody, come and join. Maybe they put you as a suicide bomber or cleaning toilets, but they wanted bodies. Um, so their appeal is very much to kind of get those numbers in, and then we'll, 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 we'll worry about it later. Nusra is very much about building a committed, small cadre of people. So, so I mean, ISIS is this power to mobilize people worldwide, to you know, have young teenagers to, to do this. Al-Qaeda, even though Nusra is pretty able, Nusra doesn't appeal to a lot of people. You don't see Nusra videos talking about conquering Rome or, you know, putting the black flag on the White House or all of this. So even though ISIS is not the world-devouring existential threat that some people portray it, it has a lot more oomph on the world stage than Nusra does. Nusra basically said, our target is power in Syria. So you can say Nusra is a larger, bigger, longer term threat in Syria than the Islamic State. But the Islamic State has this worldwide appeal. So that's why I would prioritize the Islamic State. If I was looking at Syria alone, I probably maybe might reverse it. Patrick, I'm sorry, you want to reply? Thank you very much. Uh, just a point of clarification. Uh, how important do you think military success is or has been to this point for ISIS? That is to say, military success, I, I've at least heard some military people talk about the way they have conducted their operations as differing from Al-Qaeda, at least in part because what they have um, mounted looks more like a um, conventional military campaigns where they actually seek to take and hold uh, territory. Yeah. And is it for that reason that you suggest that um, some military action would dis it would discredit their, if you will, their, their lemma, their, um, um, their, their, their label, their, 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 their notion that yeah. um, we are doing this with the permission of God, yeah. does it then imply that the permission of God is withdrawn if they are defeated. Yeah. No, I mean, this is, the, this is of course, a big difference between Al-Qaeda and ISIS. <laughs> Al-Qaeda, was Al-Qaeda against the caliphate? No. Caliphate will come fil mishmish. You know, eventually the caliphate will come. And we'll all know it and we'll see it. We'll recognize it like pornography. I know it when I see it. I know this. The Supreme Court said. You know? So, so, so um, Al-Qaeda, caliphate will happen eventually. Uh, change, will, a state will be built eventually. ISIS said no. 
state first. And of course, they were right that when you create a plausible model on the ground, you're able to make arguments that Al-Qaeda could never make. This goes kind of to your question, right? When you have a state, you tell people like Daniel Poulin, this French convert who went and who's the star of a video before he was killed, he said, come to Raqqa, you'll be taken care of here. There are houses for you. There's a good life for you here. Well, you can't make that argument if you're living in a cave in Waziristan. But when you have a proto-state facade, and ISIS puts out videos about, like, the ISIS highway patrol or the ISIS hospital, and you have an Australian guy who left Australia who's a doctor and who's a doctor in an ISIS preemie ward, you know, you're able to make arguments about the utopian state, about an authentic Muslim life, of living a life of dignity uh, and fulfillment. You have women writing these dreamy stories about how wonderful life is and stuff like that. You have all these things which are impossible in the way Al-Qaeda did things. So the, creating the state gives them a lot more oomph, a lot more, um, a wider appeal to a wider uh, audience. It's not just about gunmen or hitmen joining the state to go kill somebody. So. Bob? Thank you very much for really uh, uh, very interesting remarks. Do you think a case could be made for managing this conflict instead of trying to solve it? We've had three wars in 15 years, which cost, according to two studies, over $6 trillion. Yeah. Uh, we are militarily unbeatable, but politically we've not actually uh, caused events to move in a positive direction in any of the three countries in which we participated mm -hmm. as a military, a dominant military power. And uh, the administration is currently trying very hard to get our allies in the region to do more, which means that they have been doing less. Yeah. So, so uh, from an American standpoint, a great power standpoint, yeah. is there a case to be made as difficult as it is emotionally uh, to accept for managing this conflict instead of trying to solve it? It will take decades uh, to try to bring to a peaceful, absolutely peaceful conclusion. I just really appreciate your views on that possibility. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think you do need to manage it. I don't think that you, that, I, I, that's why, you know, you mentioned the, you mentioned three countries. I assume you mean two countries, uh, maybe two and a half, right? Uh, but if you look at Afghanistan and, and Iraq, of course, what, what, what failed was the nation state building project, you know? And um, so I agree with you on that. I, what I'm saying is that if, if a huge part of ISIS appeals, it's seeming success as a state, as an entity. You need to remove that. You can remove that without basically getting into the business of rebuilding the Middle East, which I don't think we should do. I, I mean, I didn't like Ben Rhodes' snide remarks about fundamentally broken societies. But, but certainly I agree with them. We shouldn't pay for the building of wounded societies, like I said. We should have solidarity. We should help. We should do our, our part. But it's not our role to you know, make them look like uh, Iowa or something. So there has to be a kind of a way that you exert power, military power, uh, to bring about the destruction of the state without getting sucked into the, to the rest of it. I think you can do that. I mean, you know, one of the problems is that sometimes the administration presents it as either or. You know, the administration in some of its rhetoric has presented Syria as like, oh no, we can't do anything in Syria because that would be like Iraq. Well, you know, there are lots of things you can do in Syria short of occupying Syria and deciding to build it and spending a couple trillion dollars to do so. So I, I think that we're, they're trying to manage it and, and certainly there are, there are smart ways to do it without getting sucked into a kind of mission creep. But you do have to be kind of ruthless and clear-eyed about what your goals are. And sometimes we get very fuzzy about that. So. I would say there are three more questions. So you, there's one and then thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Very interesting. I just wanted to ask you about, um, you know, solutions going forward. Yeah. You know, um, 
from everything I can gather, you know, from tonight and other research, you know, ISIS is irrational. It's not another country that we're, you know, w that we're speaking with. So, you know, what what is the right idea? Is the idea to continue to train coalition forces and, you know, continue the fight from the air and then reinforce the peace by investing and, you know, making their, these countries' economies, you know, investing in that society, what's, what's the best idea? Well, I mean, those are all elements. I mean, except for the last one, I don't think we need to, we don't have the money to basically solve the economic problems of the region. Uh, there's not that much money. Um, you know, there are, there are huge problems that, that certain economic decisions that have been made by countries there. But the certain, all the other ones you mentioned, certainly. It's about proxies. It's about you know uh, taking opportunity. You know, looking at at at, um, at at rules of engagement which make us more able to do what uh, what we want to do. I'll give you a couple of examples. For the longest time after ISIS took a huge part of Iraq and a huge part of Syria, the governments, the central governments of Iraq and Syria, were paying employees in those places, government employees. So you had a, a government employee in Mosul who was picking up the trash for ISIS and was being paid by the government in Baghdad. That's insane. Now, why are they doing it? States want to show that they, you know, that they control territory, even though they don't control territory. They want to assert their sovereignty by paying the salaries of people that are living under the Islamic State. That's crazy. Or, for example, for the longest time, the administration decided not to do anything about the oil smuggling, you know, and you had basically this rampant oil smuggling by the Islamic State with generating a lot of money. And finally they decided, of course, in the last few months to go after oil tankers, you know, after first dropping leaflets to tell them, you know, we're about to bomb you, you better leave your vehicles. Uh, so those are things that kind of, again, common sense things that you can do to, to, to make that fight more, more effective. You know, it, it's strange, you know, we kind of declared our, our, our uh, you know, decision to go after these guys in August of 2014. But a lot of the decisions that are really going to hurt them are things that we're doing right now. We've kind of been, you know, we tried to, for the other gentleman's question, we basically spent a year trying to manage it. And now we realize that actually maybe we're managing it too, too well and we need to kind of ratchet up the pressure. I think that's right. Hello. Um, you talked about the necessity for militarily defeating ISIS in order to discredit, the, discredit them and their state as, as a victorious power. Yeah. Um, but, and you also were speaking, and there was also some discussion about um, lessons learned from Iraq and Afghanistan and the failures that we've experienced in nation building in the Middle East. And um, what, so what, you, what you're describing is a punitive expedition. We, we, um, we, um, a, an, armed, an army would go in there, it would, defeat, it would defeat the Islamic State, destroy as many of them as they could, um, and try to keep it w before they scattered and went to the wind, and then withdrew. Something like that, yes. But the problem with that is, is um, well, if we leave, well, we're not holding the field. We, so we've, we've, we've stomped that down. But then you'd say al-Nusra would, would, be, would be the winners there. Um, Assad would get, would, would, would get a problem removed for him. Um, and then the Kurds would have de facto control of northern Syria, which is problematic. They have de facto control of northern Syria. Yes, but it would, but um, now, but now they would have an additional pressure removed from them, and they already have de facto Kurdistan in northern Iraq, and what's the problem is we're NATO allies with with Turkey, yeah. and Turkey has a very long and bloody history yeah. with um, reconciling Turkish identity with Kurd with Kurdish identity. Yeah. And that's why they've been taking proactive measures to go after the Kurds to keep them from to keep them from expanding, from continuing this chain of successes, benefiting from the from from betting, benefiting from um, their other powers falling down. They don't want that to come over into Turkey. Yeah. So in 
in, and that's why Turkey has been sort of on the fence about going after ISIS because they don't want to free up the Kurds hands to go and try to chop off a piece of Turkey. Yeah. So how do we how can we mount this punitive expedition if there're going to be these consequences that are going to affect our relationship with a NATO ally? Well, I mean, first of all that punitive uh, effect that you're talking about is only in Syria. For example, the Turkish government has the kind of uh, 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 you know, uh, working relationship with the Kurdish uh, region in Iraq, the Iraqi Kurdistan government. So it's not like it's a regional, a global problem. Yes, there's a problem of the PYD and its connection to the to the PKK and the fact that you know the Kurds, uh, the Turks specifically see that as a problem. But it's not. Th that's a small part of the larger issue. The punitive expedition concept is the idea that this state structure that exists is actually vulnerable, you know? To have the, the, the ISIS control of cities is something which actually is not that hard for the United States to reverse. Yes, of course, as I said in my remarks, you're going to have a basically an ISIS insurgency will continue, as in, indeed it did in, in Iraq when the Islamic State lost um, you know, a lot of its territory that it held in 2006, 2007, 2008, 2009. It's not impossible. Think about it that, you know, why does ISIS return in Iraq? ISIS does not return just because the Americans left. It returns because the Maliki government decided to follow an explicitly sectarian agenda and what's worse, an explicitly sectarian agenda and an incompetent security strategy. This is an army that had 50,000 ghost soldiers, you know, that had all kinds of corruption, that removed effective generals and replaced them with buffoons who were loyal to Maliki. So what I'm saying is that, of course, uh, yeah, the United States could always do better than local forces. But ISIS is kind of like a porcupine fish. Well, what do you call it? A puffer fish. If you're familiar with the puffer fish, right? This little fish, it's about this size. And what does it do to scare its enemies? It blows itself up, right? To look fiercer and greater than it is. The apparent power of the Islamic State is not, it's actually not existent in the real world. It's a virtual challenge. So what I'm saying is that even if the United States tomorrow removed, you know, directly or through proxies or whatever, exerted its effort and caused the collapse of the state, it's much more difficult for them to come back a second time. And we're seeing that. You know, the, the Iraqi army, with all of its serious problems that it has, with its extreme sectarianism, with its hollowed out divisions, the territory that it's taking from the Islamic State, Islamic State's not getting it back. The Kurds, who are not that powerful of a force, you know, taking Kobani, taking uh, Tel Abiyad, you know, all, doing all of this stuff, you're seeing that the Islamic State actually hasn't been able to take it back. So we're not talking about, you know, an army of occupation or the United States being there. This is actually an entity which is powerful in the minds of people, which is an all-conquering, all-powerful caliphate in, in the digital realm, but not in the real realm. So I think that there is yes, it's it's not a it's not a it's not an easy solution, but there's a lot that you can do to kind of puncture it, you know, without basically buying the thing and having to fix it and being there forever. I think that's actually a, kind of a myth. Last question. Well, again, I'd like to thank you for uh, sharing with you with us your your thoughts and based on, on, on experience. I think uh, uh, academics tend to have ideas about the world, but it's nothing like a person who's got the concrete experience. And I'm delighted that somebody in the State Department has had the experience that you've had and shared with you. Thank you. Because I've been wondering who is informed in the State Department about the Middle East, really informed about the cultural layers and the people's involved, and, I'm, and, and I think in some ways you, you talked about the crisis 
of the Middle East today being maybe uh, unique in the history of the Middle East, in some ways I think we should acknowledge that we have contributed so much to the crisis, beginning, beginning with the invasion in 2003, beginning with dumping, uh, dumping in Libya, dumping uh, Egypt, one after the other, we have, we have dumped people without realizing what after that, you know. So I, I think it's, it's, it's a matter of sober thoughts that we think before we dump somebody else. Like we've try, we're trying our best, in, in one, we've tried our best to, to, dump, uh, to dump Syria. Why? You know, in some ways, why not think perhaps of the United States gaining by having at least a, a neutral perspective, although now it's too late to have a neutral perspective on Syria, but part of the, part of the mess is, is having done the best to uh, get uh, Syria a change of regime, which I think is part of the phrase that people like to use. I just want to bring up one thing which you haven't mentioned. Uh, foreign affairs, uh, I think it's the current issue of the the previous current issue, has had a, a number of pieces on high technology. And uh, Cohen, in uh, writing in Foreign Affairs, says we have to uh, think of having a, uh, uh, using high technology to counter ISIS uh, high technology, that ISIS spends much more on videos, on cameras, on all kinds of high technology stuff than what the United States is spending. And there is another uh, piece uh, in, uh, I think it's the Massachusetts Inter uh, MIT's review, where they talk about a, 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 a person uh, in Oregon who intercepted in, in uh, high technology in, in the internet intercepted a young man who was about to go join ISIS. And he started to talk to him, and after a long discussion, he got that person to say, I'll think it over instead of precipitating. Now, that's, a, that's on a one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. But uh, when one thinks of the potential of a lot of people here and, and students and so on, adept with... Uh, the internet, uh, that is a kind of, of way of, of stymieing perhaps the expansion, the internet expansion of ISIS in, in terms of its reach. So I'm just wondering what you may think of that. Well, thank you. No, uh, you're absolutely right. A, a huge part of the radicalization process is one-to-one. -one. Uh, in other words, uh, and we talk, we, a lot of people focus on ISIS videos, right? They see that and they react to it. Those are, those are necessary, but they're not sufficient. Radicalization, uh, the historical record is, it's a social process. It's me talking to you, and it's people who have a connection with other people. So in Europe, for example, the radicalization process is often in clusters. It's relatives, it's friends, it's uh, uh, people who go to the same mosque, it's Little clusters of people radicalize here and there. In America, it's much more, we're an individualistic, more individualistic society in Europe. It's often one-to-one, -one, but still there's the personal dimension. As Heghammer said in, in, in that, that quote, which I really liked, that I quoted, it's the cultural, emotional dimension. Well, that's not something you're really going to get with mass media a lot. You're going to get that with one person talking to another person and convincing them. Think about your own life. You know, why does one person do one thing and another person doesn't, right? Personal choice, preference, conviction. Why does one person become a policeman and the other guy becomes a criminal? You know, sometimes you'll see that in the fame, same family. Or why does one person want to be in this religious group or in that religious group? It's personal. So one of the challenges we have when we fight ISIS propaganda is that all too often what we try to do is work like factories, right? Here's our product, here's our super duper anti-ISIS video with all its bells on. Just watch this and you'll never become a terrorist. The world doesn't work that way. It's a person talking to another person about their own experience. 
Uh, by the way, that's that case in, I mentioned in Washington State. It was this young woman, they spent hours talking to her and just being her friend and getting to know her and working on her. So that peer-to-peer -peer part of the radicalization process is one that is underdeveloped and un not enough work has been focused on by government. All too often we think of law enforcement, right? Boom, someone's doing something suspicious, we're going to arrest them. But you also have to, there are lots of things that happen that are short of a crime. You know, talking to people, giving them options of uh, different views of Islam, which, my goodness, they exist. They're the majority views are not views that ISIS promotes. So people need to be empowered by that personal relationship. That's a big part of, of the work that needs to be done. Thank you. So thank you very much.